Welcome to the Virtualization and Cloud Security video podcast, episode number 16, I believe. And if you're on TalkShoe or iTunes, this is episode 168 or 7 or 6 or whatever. Um, you can find is that in Hex? In Hex, <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've been doing, uh, this podcast has been running and actually Mike's been a part of it. Mike Foley's joining me. He works for VMware Technical Marketing, I believe. Is that still it? Yep. Senior Technical Marketing Architect. And whatever, that, and that in 25 cents? We'll get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> I thought Maybe. So. Maybe. <laughs> in a third world country. <laughs> you may get you one bean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at Starbucks. <laughs> one bean and a strainer for the co- the water. Anyways, um, what we want to talk about today is something that I've written about in the past, and Mike's read it, and Mike has talked about this in the past as well, and that's yep. encryption up and down the stack. Now, I'm going to come out and say that not everything needs to be encrypted. Now, so it's, Absolutely right. And it's, for some people, it's far easier to in, say, let's just encrypt everything. Right, because you've covered all your bases. But you haven't. Possibly, yes. Because now you've encrypted public data with private keys, which means that public data now becomes private in some ways. But also it becomes harder to access. So now you have a data protection or encryption, data encryption versus data availability question. And this is yep. where classifying your data becomes incredibly important. Yes. Now, most companies yes. that I know don't classify their data. They just say encrypt everything. I'm a proponent of digitally sign everything, encrypt what you have to. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, um, and, and I saw this when I worked at RSA, and we had uh, a data loss prevention product that could go out and find all spreadsheets that have um, um, credit card data in them, right? Yep. And then go in, and then go in using Windows Rights Manager. I think go ahead and encrypt those those files. Ninety nine percent of customers just wanted to know that those files were there. And that is actually a case for PCI. If you have raw credit card numbers, you actually are required to encrypt them. Right. Right. So they have to be encrypted. Well, you're required to encrypt them. But what customers would do is they would get the list of those things and then call someone up and say, you need to get rid of that file right now. And that's a problem because let's think about this. This is Windows. When you delete a file, it actually doesn't get deleted. This is what people don't realize. You actually have to truly delete it, which is overwrite it a number of different times, and then remove it from the table of contents, which is about all delete does. So that that actually brings up an interesting point when we start talking about um, a virtualized data center is the the question I get all the time is can I erase the bits that uh, on on the disk that the VMDK was on right how do I securely do secure erasure of that disk and what a lot of folks don't understand is look secure erasure was relatively straightforward when you had one hard drive that had a bunch of files on it and you wanted to erase that drive, right? You had the one hard drive, that the spinning rust. Yep. Not, it, when the power was disconnected, the cache on that drive disappeared. But when you start looking into SSDs and NVMe controllers and everything else, there are bits all over the place. Your VMDK might be living partially in SSD cache, partially on NVMe, partially on spinning rust. How do you get rid of that? How can you guarantee that you get rid of that? And and essentially, you can't. So what is... Well, you can. I think you can. Well, well, what is a... Well, the thing is, is that requires the file system and the operating system to know exactly where all those bits are and get verifiable information okay, back to I agree with you erased. about there are that, that level of paranoia people so I what I let me just get to my point this is where I think encryption actually comes into play 
because you could encrypt the contents of that VMDK, for example, and then just destroy the key. Yes. Or right. if you really wanted to do this, and now this is something that in generally is not verifiable because you can't get down to the bits you want to get down to, to get the verification. And it's not easy to do on every hypervisor out there. In fact, I don't right. know a single one that has this baked in. And right. up until now, the best thing to be, do, and up until, I mean, and, and until you start encrypting at, at, a different, at the different layers, and we'll talk about those layers, the best thing you could have done to wipe a drive is literally just overwrite it with an encrypted image. Yeah. But, and yeah. then destroy the drive, then remove the drive from the VM and then do that. But you would actually have to build that as part of your orchestration for removal. And it was not, it's but, not, but, it's not hard. That, it's not easy but to that, do. But, you know, we're, we're, we're talking encryption pros and cons there. The, the pro is, is that, okay, I can take a VM and I can boot up a live CD that yeah. has a DOD level erasure policy. And I can erase from within the virtual machine the contents of the VMDK. But if I'm using SSD drives, they have a lower mean time between failure. And the more you write to those drives, the less lifetime those drives have. And if you're doing three passes of, 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 an, of a encryption across that drive, the whole drive, you know, you may you may encounter some significant wear and tear on that. So well, that's the con that, side of doing that. It is. It's a bad side of doing that, but yeah. it's possible to do it. But the other thing that you got to oh, remember. Sure. Anything's possible. What you got to remember is that SSDs put things in weird places on the drive so that. That was my point. The problem is, is even though you overwrote it with an, an encrypted image, it didn't actually overwrite you're not, everything. You're not guaranteed. Not guaranteed, and that's where there's bits on those drives that say you must right. do this. So, right. Real, really, the only way to quote unquote guarantee it is to create the drive fresh in an encrypted state so that only data written to that VMDK is encrypted. So, don't take an existing VMDK with data on it and then re encrypt because it's not, you're not guaranteed that you've encrypted everything because it's living in some cache somewhere is create the brand new VMDK and in, encrypt it and then start writing to it. And well, then and that's at, where at, some, like at some point, yeah. using a, um, a, a well-known key shredding standard, which I'm not sure many key management providers provide yet, uh, be able to shred that key so that it never, go, never comes back. And at that stage, you can just right-click and delete that VMDK. Yeah. And now you can encrypt, and let's, let's start at the top layers. I mean, for example, sure. if I was going to create a virtual disk, I could literally lay a file system on top of that that is an encrypted file system for Linux and Windows. Those exist today. And that mm -hmm. actually exists in almost in the operating system today. But right. Lot, there, but, are some, there, there are some are, limitations. There's major limitations right. for both of those, right. and that is so you actually have in, to, in, 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 Right, so in BitLocker, for example, you need some place to store the encryption key. Now, BitLocker supports TPM and USB, but the USB, or at least it used to, I don't know what it supports lately because I haven't really dove into it, but there's no virtual TPM available today. Unless and then that, Hyper -V. and then that opens up a whole other Pandora's box of how do you manage a virtual TPM? And then, right? then I mean, this is also the, um, I mean, Hyper V. What they did was a, we're going to look at Hyper V because BitLocker and Hyper V get along really well. If you are using Hyper V and you turn on BitLocker, and you do everything right, and there's a lot of bits and twiddles you have to make here, it will create an encrypted, an encrypted enclave for the key and then automatically mount it on boot. Either calling yeah. a virtual TPM, the Hyper-V virtual security, whatever, but it's yep. not using the underlying TPM capability. It's probably using the USB approach. We don't know. We're, we're, yeah, we, we, we just don't have enough information, but I think we can probably both agree from a manageability standpoint, 
it starts getting really hairy at scale. At, when you're talking 10,000 VMs, having another v, another VMDK or another USB, another bit of data becomes painful. You now you have no way to manage it. Right, and from a and from a threat standpoint, now those keys are within the operating system of that virtual machine. Yes, and that's the other thing that you got to be aware of is that when you're in a virtual machine, the keys are always read into memory. Right. There's just no way around that. There is not a single. Right. So me, me as a malicious, me as a malicious admin, I only have to snapshot that memory, and then I can go fishing for keys. And actually, right? and fishing for keys is far easier than most people realize. Oh yeah. Now oh, there yeah. are a few products. What they do, and there's, I mean, there's actually one that I did a little bit of t t um, discussion when they came out with it and t pointed out a problem this exact problem and they basically what they did instead was yes they put it in memory but as soon as they finished using it they scrubbed it from memory so every time it, it actually had to be pushed into memory every time they wanted to decrypt so they actually left the door open quite a long time but then when it was closed it was re scrubbed from memory it was part of their process for de destroying the key so it was in memory at random places. It spread across pages. They did all these nice things. And then when they destroyed the key or closed down the encryption, encrypted enclave, the encrypted file system, they shredded the key. So it wasn't in memory until you used it again. Uh, the standard operating system procedures don't do that. This was a special right. case. And actually, it's a case that a lot of the file system level encryption technologies has been applying for a while. But if I'm a malicious admin or I have the access, I can dump memory at periodically and eventually I'll get it. Right. Right. But you have to, if in those I'm, cases, you have to be more persistent. Right. So those are the other types of things that are from it in the guest. When you so what, what, what don't we start from in the guest all the way down to the array and then come back to guest level encryption? Absolutely. We can do that. Right? So one of the other methods that I'm seeing some, some folks do is uh, they will, in guest, say, I'm going to have a non-encrypted boot partition that can go retrieve the key from somewhere. Yep and in some cases provide some type of TPM-like functionality, I, I guess. And so your, your VMDK is actually two partitions, a boot partition to go get the, the, the key, and then your C drive. Exactly. But that, that, that all, it, I'm very, very concerned personally about the workload of the IT admin. And the more complex these types of solutions are, the more avenue there is for misconfiguration, and the the less likely people are going to want to install and manage this because they just don't have that time. Well, if well, I have to touch ten thousand VMs, it well, gets well, ugly. Well, let's start. Actually, it doesn't. It does. If I'm at, using ten thousand VMs and I'm booting in the boot in, in the in the pre boot, if I'm doing Pre-boot, grab the key, decrypt the C drive or decrypt the, the slash drive or decrypt all the drives, whatever it is. Grabbing the key has to be done through a key manager. I'm sorry. If you're not using a key manager, yep. it is a management nightmare. Even with a key manager, it's not necessarily a fun thing. It's not something you want to do but, on a Friday but I've night. But I've got my keys right here. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about it, I mean, the biggest problem, con right now to any encryption at any level is that a lot of times it's an incredibly manual process. Right. Now, the ones that bake it into the operating system have already delivered all the agents it needs to do this. But if they're not, those tools can't talk to a KMIP style key manager over the KMIP protocol you now mm -hmm. have a, a, a very large management problem. And we, I, I think we can agree that you need a key manager somewhere to do it right. Right. And ideally, in the best of cases, 
that key manager should probably not be run by the IT organization. It should be managed by the security organization. Well, so that I'm going to say it's all IT. Let's not divide this up. It's IT. Security is a subset of IT, so we're going to say yeah, it's all well, IT. Well, it should be. Uh, but but it, it, do, it, it does lend itself to be one of those those things where IT is focused on enabling it, but security is focused on securing the access to those keys. Exactly. Not everyone should have access to those keys. It should be very limited. So that's the biggest problem with a key manager. But we can agree that there's multiple types of key managers out there. There's ones you can put in software. There's hardware versions yep. of it. There are network versions of it. I mean, you can pick and choose. Now, there's also some yep. really cool chipset features that are going to be coming out in the hardware soon that are going to make yes. almost every host a key manager. <laughs> right. So key management's not going to be a problem much longer of uh, very expensive hardware. Yeah, I think there'll be plenty of options around key management. So I think for the case of, for the, the case of this conversation, what we want people to understand is um, you want a separation between the encryption solution and the management of the keys. Yes. And that the key management has to be as available as DNS, NTP, etc. It becomes a key, no pun intended, a key infrastructure component. That if you don't, if you can't just say, oh yeah, yeah, the key manager will be up in an hour or two. Okay, but that means none of my VMs that are rebooting will be able to be up in an hour or two. I guess let's let's, let's do a different equation. I think that you got to equate it to Active Directory. If you have Active Directory or Directory services in your environment, that can't go down. <laughs> right. So and key, key manager should be at the same the same availability level. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. And that may or may not be a discussion for your virtualization vendor. That's a probably a discussion you're going to have with your key manager vendor. Yes. Right. So when you sit down with your key manager vendor and say, "Well, look, I've got uh, I've got data centers here, here, and here." And I need to be able to make sure that the keys are available to all of those data centers. Um, what sort of configuration are you going to sell, sell me such that my key managers don't, quote unquote, go away? And actually, the more I think about key managers, <clears throat> granted, you and I have been thinking about this stuff for a very long time. Yep. If you equate key manager at the same level of necessity as Active Directory, actually the Active Directory designs that you do for availability will apply to all the key manager designs that you do. So you right. can do the same exact thing and they can mimic each other. As a matter yep. of fact, Microsoft goes so far as to actually have such key manager and certificate ser servers actually as part of Active Directory right? because they know this as well. So you don't have to worry about people going off and saying this, but if they if you know Active Directory availability and someone's trying to sell you key management availability, it's incredibly different question now. Right. Right. It's about it should the same. Be on, it should be on par. Uh, it should be as available. Yes. Um, you may or may not want to tie your key management to your Active Directory directly. Because if your Active Directory goes down, your key management goes down, and if you can't, and if any of those components are encrypted, you may find yourself in a catch twenty two situation. Exactly. Right. That's why I, there's certain functions that I look at as: Do I really want that to be part of another solution that is codependent? I would keep them right? as separate entities. Separate, separate but equal by entities. Separate but equal entities, and yep. that would be the best design you can probably come up with for key management. Right. Now, but we can we we've solved key management now. Okay. But we right. we can assume that start we, going down the stack. It, we go down the stack. Now we said in guest. In guest right now is per VM, and the keys are set up per VM. When you start talking about BitLocker and the tools like that, now. When we do in guest and you're installing agents from vendors, and they do exist, those you want to make sure. Right now, there's a there's two or three products that I know of that will sell you an agent that will talk to a key manager. Yep. And those they will scrub memory 
when they're no longer using it and so forth. Right. These are good. As a matter of fact, these are the ones that databases use. Right. Right. When you think about it, um, and I'm going to mention a company name here, like companies like Vormetric have been around forever. They've been right. doing database encryption for however long the world's been around. Right. They will. They first started with you had to have the keys baked into a little file somewhere. And now they're using key managers. Yeah, it, but in those particular types of solutions, you're talking solutions that are encrypting the data before they go into the database, not necessarily encrypting the operating system disks. Correct. So there's multiple right. layers of ingress that you need to worry right. about, and ultimately it is about the data, not necessarily the operating system. <laughs> right. You you might you might be able to pass a an audit. If the operating system is not encrypted, but the data that is in the operating system yes. is encrypted, but that's a that's a discussion for your QSA, not for not for the two of us. Not for the two of us. <laughs> we're not going to help you pass that audit. No, but you actually. And the biggest thing you have to worry about. Let's talk auditing for a second at all these layers. Yep. Is the best thing you need to do is if you want to pass an audit, do two things. Know your data and know its encryption requirements and figure out how to get there in an available solution. It's really what we're talking and about. And I, I would add one more to that. Sure. Know your auditor. Work with if your, your auditor. auditor doesn't really understand the technology and the depth of it, it might be time for a new auditor. <laughs> yes. The, and that that goes that goes for so many other things too. And that's the thing is that when you're getting audited and they don't understand the technology, you actually do have the right to request an auditor that does. Yes. Don't don't live with someone that doesn't understand, but try to find analogies that may help him understand, because he's going to do this to someone else and just pass it along. Right. Let's put it this way: if you know your data, you know your compliance standard. You know what you need to do. You understand the encryption's pros and cons. You'll be able to explain it to your auditor in a way that they'll understand. Because you're going to have to explain it to your business owner the way they understand. And they only understand the business. Right. And so I think one of the things we, before we continue, is really talking about what we're trying to mitigate here. And what we're really trying to mitigate is data data becoming in the possession of people who shouldn't have that data. Correct. Now, whether it's they are uh, connected to the database and they're doing a, a database dump and grabbing all that data, whether they're uh, surfing through memory snapshot files, regardless, people who shouldn't have the data shouldn't. Uh, that's why one of the reasons why we encrypt is to ensure that they don't get that data. And that is up and up to and including a admin with too many privs who's maybe disgruntled walking out the door with a whole set of virtual machines on a USB drive. That has happened. It, many times, actually. Right? It's not that many hard. Many times. Many times. Now, right. and this is the thing. This is what you need to do. So who you, you also need to know from whom you're protecting the data. But I would go one step further. Because you always do. I always do. Encryption <laughs> techniques also applied to digital signing techniques. Actually, as part of almost every encryption technique is a digital signature. Right, but I think that's almost a whole other podcast. It is, but is, I'm, I'm going to bring up the one thing. is if you digitally, The other reason why a lot of people is encrypt is to be able to detect changes, to prevent changes without the right people doing it. If you digitally sign something, you can also prevent changes or at least detect changes. Right. Because the signatures won't match, so right. So you've got to think about why you're doing it and what you need to do for that chunk of data. Classifying your data is incredibly important. We're going to talk mostly about PCI and HIPAA data on this rest of this podcast. We're going to assume it all has to be encrypted. Sure. So we've already talked about in-guest encryption, the different types of in-guest encryption. Um, let's kind of jump. More. Which one jump down the layer. One more. Well, what I want to do is go to the next layer, which is probably um, um, the I.O. subsystem layer. Yes. Right? 
Uh, so I'm talking like array-based encryption or switch-based encryption. Uh, or, my, my, you my, don't want to jump to that? No, that's a little layer, a little bit lower than where I want to go right next. The IO sublayer for me is anywhere from the bottom of the VM to the the fabric cards or the, the HPAs that are sitting inside of the, the individual servers. Okay. That would be okay. the I.O. layer that I want to talk about next because it's actually as close to the virtual machine as you can get. And it covers okay. things like, oh, the hypervisor as well as those fabric cards. Now, Let's what, leave the hypervisor part to the end. Well, the hypervisor has always been, you should be able to encrypt in the hypervisor. At the moment, no one has a product for sale that can encrypt in the hypervisor. That is correct. At the moment. At the moment. Now, and that's, I mean, you look at some of the things that are coming out when you start reading all the encryption white papers, it's per, and the, the science that's coming out around this is actually pretty fantastic. But when you start thinking about it, there's multiple places to encrypt in any hypervisor. And I'm just going to say the places yep. you can. You can actually, okay. at the moment, in every hypervisor, tie into the SCSI path, the, v, the path from the VMDK to the actual physical hardware. That can mm -hmm. be tied into you can tie in the I.O. path, I should say, because it may not be SCSI. Yep. It could be anything. So you can tie into right. that I.O. path. Right. And if you're allowed a driver and you can do that, that's great. Most hypervisors don't have that tie-in yet. Then you can actually go a step layer and have a encrypting driver that is talking to a physical piece of hardware. That's possible okay. as well. Sure. Everything's going to so go you through. Do do, doing doing that at a controller level. Well, above the controller, the, the driver, driver level. Drive for the controller. Yeah. And the controller has some type of encryption bits on it and is able to write encrypted bits. Or you're encrypting using ASNI in the driver and doing the overhead there. Now, yeah. the other layer is actually what most people don't know is that every HBA that is used for fiber channel or iSCSI Mm -hmm. Not NFS, that's just standard network. Actually, most networking have it on it, too. Actually have encrypting encryption processors built into the hardware. Mm -hmm. No one turns them on. It's probably an issue of managing keys. Exactly. So, well, I'd say, I shouldn't say no one. Very few people turn that on. Well, it's it's really kind of a binary operation. It doesn't allow you to say, I'm going to encrypt my PCI data with this and my HIPAA data with that. Exactly. It's, it's all everything is encrypted. It's all and if I just grab the one key, you know, it's the one key to rule them all, and I can decrypt. So that's the I.O. path, and now there's a, pro yep. there's, there's a major con to the I.O. path approach. And that is, is that if I break into the VM, everything that I've read, I read in the VM is actually already unencrypted. Because it's already re I'm reading through the I/O path, which is doing that encryption for me. Once I read above the I/O path, right. it's unencrypted. So I have a meeting in ten minutes, so we've got to wrap up fairly quickly. Um, the 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 issue I see with the I/O path thing, it's more like uh, encrypting in flight. Yes. Right. It's just encrypting the the path from the virtual machine to the VMDK on the disk, but it's not act, it doesn't it doesn't mitigate the threat of someone walking up and copying that VMDK. So while that's interesting from you know a uh, data at rest data in motion type of discussion, it's really kind of beyond where I want to go. I, I'm more interested in mitigating the threat of someone walking. Now, someone encrypts in the I.O. path, the VMDK that's written onto the disk is actually encrypted. The data written to the disk is encrypted because you've written through all the encryption layers. When you read above that encryption layer, that's when it becomes unencrypted. Yep. So if I'm actually a admin and I go and attach to uh, try to get to that VMDK, and I'm using the driver or HBA approach, once I read that data in and through that driver HBA, it's unencrypted. But if I'm in the higher levels in the IO path at the top of the stack, 
I'm not going to hit that because it's actually from the VM all the way down. Right. So you got to be careful where you do this. If I'm encrypting right. in the VM, if I take the VMDK, it's encrypted. So you got to remember where you read from is really becomes the, the, the point of knowledge that you need. Right, right. So the next layer down would be the array itself. Exactly. And switches, right. and let's just say switches and arrays. Yeah, so switches is more encrypting in flight, but you know the contents are, are encrypted. Arrays is I'm doing the encryption. The clear text I.O. is coming directly from the VM through the hypervisor over the fabric, whatever that fabric is, to the array in clear, and then in the array it is being encrypted possibly with a key manager, possibly the key managers built into the array, and then written down onto the LUN, and if and possibly directly to the VMDK, but you know, that's possible. Depends if they're using uh, but it's or but, not. but it's yeah, VVALs are involved. Um, and that that checks a box. That checks the encryption at rest right? box. Right. Actually, it also all of allow- these check the encryption at rest box. It it, it may also allow um, less of an impact to dedupe and compression. Yes. Because the dedupe and compression happens before it's encrypted and before it gets dumped onto the disk. Yes. Once you or encrypt, discs. dedupe and compression are not going to happen. Yeah. So in the interest of time, I just kind of want to jump to getting some feedback. I am. No, I'm huh. not. I am. Um, so in the interest of time, one of the things I'd like to kind of jump into is, um, you know, you mentioned hypervisor-based encryption. Yes. Um, yes. If you are part of the VMware beta for, the, for, for vSphere, um, there are some very interesting labs that we would be wanting to have uh, a lot of feedback on around hypervisor-based encryption. Uh, I've talked about this as part of a tech preview at a couple of recent VMUGs. It was talked about at VMworld uh, at, at, during an encryption session as a tech preview. Um, I am legally obligated to say tech preview. And uh, it's a really interesting way of tackling encryption. So that encryption, uh, the encryption is done at the hypervisor level. The I/O comes out of the virtual SCSI device and goes through a filter before it ever hits any of the I/O subsystem in the hypervisor. It goes through a filter. That filter has a key, and that key is encrypted with the key from a key manager. And so, when booting up. VCenter would go grab the key from the key manager, unlock the key that is being used for the virtual machine, and then all I.O. written from the virtual machine gets written to the disk encrypted. Now, within the virtual machine, it has no idea that it's being encrypted. So there's no worry about keys. If I, if I compromise the virtual machine, I'm not going to compromise the integrity of the key because that's all done underneath the virtual machine. So that's that's something to think about when you're starting to uh, evaluate maybe next year's plans for for encryption is uh, um, you know look at some of the tech preview stuff that is available in the vSphere beta. I think that would be pretty helpful. And actually, everybody should. It's, this has been demo that last VM World I saw some I saw it again at the MC World at the VMugs. It's very cool, but it still has a basic issue that everybody has to still deal with. And that which is, is? Which is, is once I read through the encryption layer, I'm now in the VM, the data is unencrypted. Well, yes. So if I, if I break into the running VM, I will have access to encrypted data. But that's a, that's a different place. Really, the threat we're mitigating here is that if someone walks off with a copy of the of, of the VM, they're not even going to be able to boot that VM unless they can get a key from the key manager. Exactly. So 
the, the insider threat or anybody has access to the hypervisor, since they're not in the vSCSI path when they access the virtual disk, the, vir the uh, virtual file system, will grab an encrypted copy. There's no way to decrypt right. it. Now, in right. some of the other I.O. path mechanisms at the other side of the I.O. path, the hypervisor reads through, and when I grab that disk, I still read through that same hypervisor, and it will decrypt for me. Right. So you got to be right. careful where in the I.O. path that we're talking about you do your encryption. Look at them all. Yeah. But and, you, you know, the, 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 still... one, of the, one of the advantages to doing it within the hypervisor is that the, the um, clear text uh, stuff, the unencrypted data, never actually get, gets written to anything on a wire. It's all essentially in-memory I.O. that is happening coming out of the virtual SCSI device going directly into an encryption path. And then that encryption is done using CPU primitives like AES and I, you know. In the um, keys will probably be an SGX and a few other things in the future. I don't know. I don't know either. Everybody, we're, we're talking about this is SGX is a very futuristic yeah, and thing from Intel that should be out in the Skylake chips that are out now, but they're not available yeah. to the server. So people what, what's 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 really interesting. What's really going to be interesting is are the chips that are coming out next year, where their AESNI instruction set is uh, going to be. And I saw a slide. Don't quote me. I saw it on some website somewhere. They're talking like seventy percent, seven zero percent faster than the existing AESNI available today that and cool. 20, 28 cores each with an AESNI instruction set that's, that's just that's kind of really mind-boggling so when people start talking performance it's like when do you plan on installing all this stuff oh next year buy new hardware next year <laughs> actually I would I think next year or the year after is going to be a very interesting new hardware I, I I think the next three next two to four years, you're going to see such a massive change in capability in the data center, especially leveraging virtualization. Um, things like encryption will become closer and closer and closer to near speed levels, near you know you know yeah. near transit levels, uh, so that the whole issue of performance overhead. Won't be, won't be as well, or at least won't be as important. And what you really ought to be considering is what is the overhead from how do I manage all of that? So if I have to manage that within each and every virtual machine, that has a finite people cost. Whereas if I manage it via policy at the hypervisor, it's just applying a policy. Well, and you so, also got with policy. That, I, guess I have to, I have to roll. And just two things. So people, when you, when you when you take away from this is that even with encryption, you still have to protect your assets, your virtual assets. Yes. You can't ignore those. Just because you encrypted below the VM doesn't mean the VM is truly protected. You guys still do all that detection, prevention, right. um, role-based access controls, the work. You have to limit access still. And really have a solid, solid key manager architecture. Because if the key manager is not there, we're not even going to be having questions of performance because nothing's going to be booting. Exactly. Well, and don't you. find, don't put yourself in a catch twenty two situation yeah. where you have, you know, in order to in order to boot something, I need to unlock something. But in order to unlock something, I need to boot something. Yeah. So remember, key manager and Active Directory should be peers, separate, and but yet separate from each other, different domains. Yep. Yes. All right. With that, um, thank you very much, Mike. It's been very interesting. Hope the audience has enjoyed. It. If you have any questions, feel free to send um, email and or twitters to both of us. We're both on there. I'm at text. I will at Mike underscore Foley. And, nope. At Mike Foley. No underscore. Oh, at Mike Foley. Sorry, no underscore. And you can find us at email as well in, in our normal places. This is a very important topic. And I think that it was going to be more interesting as the year, as the year go, finishes. Yes, I think it's going to be a lot more fun by the end of the year. Exactly. Well, guys, right. thank you. Have a great day.
You too.